Hello, good day everyone. Uh, I am Engineer Lloyd John Stompak and I will be discussing to you about the fundamentals of electronics or, or specifically the topic introduction to electronics. No? Uh, before my presentation, you can see here some pictures. Um, light bulb, uh, light bulb is like commonly the symbol for innovation. And with this, this picture here, you can see it's like uh, it's a motherboard where you can see some holes where you can embed some several electronic or electrical components. In this picture, yeah, it's a printed circuit board where you see a mounted uh, resistors, capacitor, and a transformer, and some wires, some connections. So these are all related to electronics now. And as you can see here also, the, this picture is, uh, is the concept about biometrics huh? using the measurements of uh, designated measurements of the human body, like for example, the face, the features, in order to uh, verify your identity. Uh, it's also part of electronics engineering. And also this part, uh, it's called the transponder, capable of transmitting and receiving signals, um, radio frequency or microwave signals for processing. Uh, still in electronics engineering uh, application, specifically in the communications part. So, so much of this, uh, before we discuss fully, uh, these several applications, these several things connected to electronics engineering, uh, we need to discuss first the, you know, uh, the basic theories about electronics engineering. Okay, so let's start. It all starts with the atom. Okay? Uh, the atom where composed is composed by electrons, proton, neutron, and in the centermost part of the atom is called the nucleus. No? The atom is the smallest particle of an element which retains the characteristics of that element. No? And the proton and the neutron comprise the nucleus. And moving around it are the electrons. Okay, so electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, and the neutron doesn't have a charge at all. So that is the atom. Now, as you can see here in the table, uh, in the first column, you see the particle. The second column is the mass and the third column is the charge expressed in columns. So here are the details for the electron, the mass and the charge, the proton, its specific mass and charge and the neutron, the mass and then no charge. So we know that the mass of a proton or neutron is approximately 1,836 times that of an electron. So with this also, uh, we also have some several terminologies here. Like what do you mean when you hear the word atomic weight or atomic mass designated with the letter, capital letter A, uh, it is defined as approximately the sum of the number of protons and neutrons of an atom. On the other hand, atomic number or the Z number is defined as the number of protons in the nucleus or number of electrons in a given atom. The third terminology we have here is the valence shell. No? It's the outermost shell of an atom. The outermost shell of an atom because an atom has several level of shells. No? As, as you can remember, um, as you can remember in your previous uh, science subjects, there are several level of shells in an atom. Then we also have this valence band. Valence band is the highest energy band of an atom which can be filled with electrons. Last but not the least, the conduction band the energy band where electrons can move freely. So I think uh, some of you have uh, encountered uh, these terminologies no? in, your, uh, in your science subjects, way back in high school, way back in senior high school. So with this, I'm presenting it to you again, just for a recap, because uh, along the way, during our discussions, you may be encountering again these terminologies and it's better to familiarize them again and remember their concepts so that when new concepts about electronics engineering are presented to you, it would be easier for you to comprehend this um, newfound knowledge or new theories that needs to be understood. Okay, so um, we have three material classification uh, in the field of electronics engineering. Okay, so we have the conductors, we have the insulators, and we have the semiconductors. Okay, so conductors allow the flow of electricity very readily. Uh, very good examples of conductors are metals like Cu. Cu is copper, right? Ag. Uh, Ag stands for 
Uh, it's it's an it's the symbol for silver. Okay, and Al is uh, Al Al is for aluminum and etc. So any form of metals usually are counted as conductors because uh, they are called conductors because they allow almost zero resistance in the flow of electricity. Then we have the second material classification. It's called they are called insulators. Now, insulators have an extremely high resistance to the flow of electricity. Example of it is that uh, rubber, plastics, glass. Huh? Now, um, they are called insulators because um, whenever there is a flow of electricity, whenever you use this type of materials, almost no electricity flow onto them. Okay, so 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 if you want electricity to flow freely, use conductors. If you want electricity to not just flow that easy, then use insulators. Okay, so the third are called the semiconductors. So semiconductors, like semi, half or almost conductors, okay? So semiconductors have their name, obviously, because by definition, semiconductors are, material, are materials having characteristics between conductors and insulators. Okay, so these semiconductors, uh, the world of electronics engineering or the field and application of electronics engineering usually revolve around this type of materials. Uh, the, the famous uh, samples or uh, examples for materials, semiconductor materials, are the germanium and the silicon. Okay, so we will be discussing more of these applications in the next slides. Okay, so now here comes energy gap. Energy gap is defined as the energy required to move one valence electron from the valence band to the conduction band. Uh, so. Why are we discussing this energy gap? Because we are trying to debunk some theories or some, um, some superstitions about, uh, about how we analyze electricity or how electricity really works. So as you can read in this conversation, this first uh, character said that, so does it mean that only conductors allow electricity flow? Insulators will never ever allow electricity flow and semiconductors are hybrid. So it's be, it is being answered by another person or by another character. And that character responded that only conductors allow electricity flow. The answer is no, no, no. All materials are capable of allowing electricity flow. It is all about what we call energy gap. Okay. So uh, we should not generalize automatically that conductors are the only one capable of um, electricity flow. It also means that insulators also have the capability to allow electricity to flow to them, but they just require higher energy gap, okay? So what is this energy gap? Uh, let's have some examples for the next slide, okay? So this, the, the, the insulator had an energy gap, which is greater than five electron volt. So, uh, so remember, the unit for energy gap is electron volt. And they have, and for the three different material classifications, they have different levels of energy gap. See, so insulators, their energy gap are greater than five electron volt. That means uh, we have this balance band, okay, balance band or balance band or this is happening no? in the outer, outermost shell of an of an atom where the electrons reside. Like uh, this is the balance band and this is the conduction band. So the electrons can only go to the conduction band if the five electron volt minimum is being surpassed by the flow of electric current, okay? So if, you, if your elect, electrical flow is greater than five electron volt, then the valence band, the electrons from the valence band can go to the conduction band. And when that happens, that phenomenon where the electrons from the valence band will go to the conduction band, that is called electricity flow. There is electricity flow. Just in the insulator part, it just needs a higher level, um, a higher force that needs to be, um, uh, needs to be uh, provided with greater value in order to let the electricity flow. Okay, so for the conductor, as you can see, 
all they have zero electron volt at room temperature. So their energy gap is approximately zero electron volt, zero electron volt at room temperature. And that means whenever there is electricity flow, and you can see an atom here connected uh, where the, where the uh, electricity will try to flow in that material, and since it doesn't have or almost zero electron volt, automatically there is no such thing as resistance. So automatically the electrical current will just flow freely into that material because it doesn't need any form of um, higher than two electron volt or higher than three electron volt, almost zero electron volt, so almost no resistance. So automatically the electric current would be happy to flow, automa flow automatically because there's no such thing as resistance in their part. Now, so that those are for the conductor materials. No? For the semiconductor materials, Isuria, no semiconductor. It has the characteristics like that of an insulator and also of a conductor. So as you can see, this forbidden band, forbidden band, or the band where you need to surpass the value of the energy gap, it is lesser compared to the insulator. Okay, lesser compared to the insulator. So that means if the electricity would find it really hard to flow automatically or easily to the insulators very very freely in the conductors then in semiconductors it's like in between no they will also find resistance in the form of 1.1 electron volt for silicon 0.67 electron volt for germanium and 1.41 electron volt for gallium arsenide no so there's still resistance, but has a lesser resistance compared to that of an insulator. So that, that is the characteristic of a semiconductor and its energy gap. Okay. So again, to simplify, if you imagine yourself to be an electric current, it would be very easy to pass in conductor materials because they have zero electron volt or their energy gap is zero. So it would be very easy to pass in this room no for semiconductors you need to have the effort of surpassing 1.1 electron volt 0.67 electron volt or 1.41 electron volt to surpass and flow freely on semiconductors and then in insulators if this is the hardest part you need to surpass the 5 electron volt in order for you to proceed from valence band the conduction band before you can really flow as a electrical current in insulators okay so it's more like conductors are easy semiconductors is not that easy and then insulators are very hard to flow if you're the electricity okay and then just a reminder remember that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules okay so Maybe uh, that would, uh, you need to be familiar with that concept, especially if it is your first time to hear the term electron volt. So it is being defined here in terms of its value in terms of joules. Okay. So energy bands are known as shells. No? Energy bands are known as shells. Uh, as you can remember, we have different level of shells. As you remember in your, I think it's in integrated science or chemistry where there are several levels of shells like um, S, P, D, and F. Uh, if you remember the electron configuration like 3S, 3P, 3D, 3F, no? And you've encountered those, those, uh, uh, those letters like S, P, D, and F. So what does S, P, D, F mean? Uh, if you can remember, S stands for um, sharp, uh, P stands for um, principal, D stands for diffuse and F stands for fundamental. No, so those are the fundamental shells: sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. The SPDF, the one we use in electron configuration. So they are actually representing the different shells. Uh, that's uh, as you can see, where in energy bands are related to, and there are always energy gap between shells. Energy increases as the distance from the nucleus increases. No, so. It's a theory, again, that we need to recall. 
because uh, this may you may have encountered these theories, but now these theories again are being presented to you because you need to familiarize them again, recall your knowledge about them because it is the basic unit theories about electronics engineering, of the atom, the shells, the energy gap, okay, the proton, the electron, the neutron. No, it's it, it, it may be in a microscopic level, but they are the heart of concept of understanding um, electrical engineering or electronics engineering. Okay, so we need to review them first before proceeding to other concepts. Okay, so in terms of valen valence electrons, how will we know that a material is a conductor, an insulator, or a semiconductor? So we have here, no? for conductors, we have one to three valence electrons. No? So uh, in terms of the valence electrons or the electrons in the valence shell, and, we, and as we know, the valence shell is the outermost shell. No? It's an outermost shell of an atom. So electrons residing in valence shells are called valence electrons. And to know whether uh, like a given atom or a given element or material is a conductor, an insulator, or a semiconductor, we need to know like what are the specific range or numbers of valence electrons in order for us to know whether it's a conductor, insulator, or semiconductor. Now we have this. For conductors, we have one to three. For insulators, five to eight. And for semiconductors, specifically four. Four only, okay? So for conductors, as you can see, if you will be asked, how many valence electrons are the best conductors have? How many valence ele electrons does the uh, best conductors have? Is it one, is it two, or is it three? Okay, so the best conductors only have one valence electron because that one valence electron, it would be easier for it to move because it is only one rather than the three moving together. Okay, so can we put it into your knowledge that the best conductors only have one valence electrons. How about the question about for insulators? How many insulators does the best insulators have? I know, how many valence electrons does the best insulators have? Five, six, seven, or eight? Now, remember the octet rule? Remember the octet rule? Remember the um the noble gases okay so if you if you read again about them it these are all connected because the best insulators have eight have eight valence electrons because as you can remember about the octet rule octet rule no an atom stabilizes if its valence electrons are equal to eight. That's why we have this octet rule in order to understand the stability of how um, how atoms behave. No, So if, if the best conductors have only one valence electron, then the best insulators have eight valence electrons in order to signify the octet rule and stabilize themselves. That's why as you can see, if you if you uh, review about the noble gases like the krypton, radon, uh, xenon, neon, um, argon, these noble gases are counted as noble because uh, it's being connected like uh, in the past history. Like they're noble because they don't easily react to uh, external stimuli like um, heat, sudden change in temperature or current. They don't react. Uh, if, if there is current flow, they don't automatically allow current to flow because they have this um, considerable amount of energy gap. So that's why they are sometimes called the snowball because they don't react easily as elements. So even you expose them to um, high heat or exposure to electricity, they don't react. So that's why they're called snowball. Okay. So those are for insulators. Now for semiconductors, semiconductors by default have four valence electrons, okay? Four valence electrons. 
not three, not two, not one, not five, six, seven, eight, specifically and strictly four valence electrons. Okay, so we have the famous silicon atom and the germanium atom or the silicon and germanium, uh, the most famous uh, examples of uh, semiconductors. Okay, uh, we have they have treasured voltages in the form of germanium has 0.3 volts and silicon has 0.7 volts. Okay, so as you can see, and their valence electrons or electrons in the outermost shell, as you can see in the silicon atom, it has four valence electrons. And as you can see in the germanium atom, it has four, one, two, three, four, four valence electrons. Okay, so the valence electrons in the germanium atom reside in the fourth shell, while those in the silicon are in the third shell, closer to the nucleus. This means that the germanium valence electrons are at higher energy are at higher energy levels than those in silicon. Therefore, these germanium valence electrons require a smaller amount of additional energy to escape from its atom. Okay, so remember also that an electron that has escaped from the valence shell is called the free electron. Okay, it's called a free electron. Now, when an electron jumps to the conduction band, a vacancy is left in a semiconductor crystal. The vacancy is called hole. Okay, so when an electron then merges again with a hole or another hole, the process is called the combination. Okay, so the term hole is used, as you can see in the picture, oh, this is the valence band, or specifically this is happening in the valence shell. So when an electron is excited with this heat energy or an electric current trying to flow, no, that electron reacts in the form of jumping from the valence band to the conduction band only if this heat energy surpasses the energy gap of the material classification so if it's, if, so if it's insulator it has a higher energy gap now if it's a semiconductor it has a lesser energy gap and if it's a conductor its energy gap is zero no so for example as you can see here, a hole happens if there is current flow, and then this uh, free uh, this electron will jump from the valence band to the conduction band. Automatically, it is called free electron. And since it jumped from the valence band to the conduction band, a hole is created. Okay, a hole is created. So holes are created if one electron from valence band jumps to the conduction band. Okay, remember that, guys. Huh? Remember. And then if this free electron will go back to a hole or to another hole, that process is called recombination. So uh, sometimes in this, uh, they use the term electron hole pair. It's a pair because sometimes it goes back and then it goes down. It goes back, it goes down, it goes back, it goes down. So it, it's more like a, a microscopic process. Now we can see it in our naked eyes. But this is based on theory. Okay, so remember, a hole is not the same as proton. Uh, if uh, if you will study further, you might encounter that the holes, even though they're just holes, uh, during calculation or during uh, presentation or simulation purposes, uh, a hole is designated with a positive charge. Now the discussion is this: a proton. A hole is not the same as proton because, as we know, proton has positive charge. But a proton has a positive charge, but a hole behaves only like it has a positive charge since it attracts electron. So remember, no? So remember, it attracts electrons. As you can see in the combination, no? uh, it, uh, when an electron in the valence shell is excited, is being excited by an external uh, electrical potential, it goes from the valence band to the conduction band. Now, if that free electron goes back to a hole, it's called recombination. So as you, that's why they put the charge positive to a hole, even though it doesn't have literally a charge, but they put a designation that a hole has a positive charge because the electron, which has a negative charge, is being attracted back to it, especially if the, especially if the uh, electrical potential or the heat energy is being removed. No? So the positive reacts, uh, attracts negative. So th this is one of the main reasons that even though holes doesn't have a positive charge theoretically, but the behavior 
of a negatively charged electron coming back to the hole signifies something that the hole attracts electron. It attracts negative. So for convention and understanding purposes, holes are being designated with, with positive charge. Okay, but the real reason again huh, is a hole is not the same as the proton. A proton has a positive charge, but a hole behaves only like it has a positive charge since, since, uh, since it attracts electrons. Okay? So, semiconductors in the field of electronics, we have the elements, you know, elements and elements with the same group group together, it's called compound. You know? So, but if it's they are singular, it's called elements. You no, know? elements, the most famous ones are the germanium and the silicon. And the compounds, when you when you try to uh, join uh, gallium and arsenic, you have gallium arsenide, uh, gas. You, when you when you join aluminum and arsenic, it's called aluminum arsenide. And when you join gallium and phosphorus, it's called gallium phosphide. No? So what I'm presenting here to you are the ones commonly used. Okay. Now the process of uh, the compound semiconductors are created using a process called doping. No, doping where uh, one group of element is being combined strategically or chemically or uh, um, scientifically. The process is called doping, no? the process of creating these semiconductors. So this gallium arsenide, this aluminum arsenide and gallium phosphide happen or are being created with a process called doping. Okay. Now, the question is, what, how does doping really works? So doping really works with this next slide. Okay, so if we have the semiconductor materials, no? um, if you have an intrinsic material or a pure material, pure, no? uh, it, it's not being mixed with other with, with other materials, it's, it's called intrinsic. But when that material is being fused with or combined with other materials, it's already not pure. And from intrinsic, it is now called extrinsic. Okay. Now, by definition, doping is the process of adding impurities to an intrinsic material. So, extrinsic material is equal to intrinsic material plus impurity atoms. Okay. Now, how it is being created? So, we have uh, we have different uh, we have two types uh, of materials that are being used in the process of doping. We have the n-type materials and we have the p-type materials. So how will we know that the material is n-type? Now, this gives us the idea that the another name of n-type is pentavalent. Penta, penta, which means phi. No, phi, phi valent, phi valent. Therefore, pentavalent or n-type materials are those elements or materials that has five valence electrons or five electrons in its outermost shell in its valence shell it's called pentavalent okay now the other material is called p-type the trivalent trivalent tri three which means three valent three valence electrons or three electrons in the outermost shell or three electrons in the valence shell no? So, these are their definitions. So, if you remember n-type, simply called, it's sometimes called pentavalent, and the p-type is trivalent. Sometimes called, the p-type is sometimes called also trivalent. Now, remember, when you create semiconductors or about the concept of or characteristics about semiconductors, it can be called a semiconductor if their valence electrons are four. Strictly four. So how are you going to create these semiconductors if you have the n-type which has five valence electrons and also the p-type which has three valence electrons? So how will the three become four and how will the five become four? Because again, huh, semiconductors are those that has strictly four semiconductor uh, four valence electrons so that's why in order for the pentavalent to become four it needs to donate its excess electron in order for it 
to be come four. So from five, I will give the other one. So from five, it becomes four. Okay. So that's why it's sometimes called donor atoms. Now for the p-type, it only has three. It needs another one. And in order for it to become four, it should accept an extra atom. No? An extra atom or extra impurity. So that means the five needs to donate its excess and the three needs to accept another one. So from five, it becomes four, it's donor atoms, and the three becomes four because it accepts another one. Okay, so that happens. That is the most simple explanation of doping. The pentavalent will donate its excess atoms and the trivalent will accept these excess atoms or impurities. Now, most famous, um, most famous examples of n-type materials are phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony. And for the p-type, the most uh, famous uh, or common examples are boron, indium, and gallium. Okay, so as you can see in, in our example here, previously, gallium arsenide. So therefore, gallium arsenide, gallium has three valence electrons, Gallium and arsenic. Arsenic has five valence electrons, so the arsenic will share or will donate its fifth valence electron to gallium in order for gallium to be four and for arsenic also to be four. So then gallium arsenide is created. Okay, so like for example, uh, gallium phosphide. So the phosphorus that has five valence electrons will donate its fifth valence electron for in order for it to be the fourth valence electron of gallium. So that's how you see doping works. No? So, but since the this n-type material is intrinsic, is intrinsic, and this p-type material is intrinsic, but joining them together in order for them to become semiconductors. From intrinsic materials, they become. I uh, know. From intrinsic materials, they become extrinsic materials. Okay, so that's it. Now, so the conductivity of silicon and germanium can be drastically increased by the controlled addition of impurities to the intrinsic semiconductor material. No, so the majority carriers of p-type materials are holes. No, that's why it has a positive charge, conventional charge of positive. And for the n-type materials. In type materials, their majority carrier are electrons. Okay, the minority carrier for p-type materials are electrons, and the minority carriers for n-type materials are holes. Okay, so for the n-type material, that that's why the majority carrier are electrons, and it has a sign of negative, negative, which means that it needs to remove an excess. It's a negative. Okay, and for p-type, it has a convention also of plus. Because it needs to accept. It needs to accept. So that's positive. I need to accept. So my charge should be positive. And for n type, since I need to donate, that's why my charge should be negative. Okay. So those are their conventions, sign conventions. Okay. So the very much popular rectifier diode is a good example of a created semiconductor no? device using P and n type material. So as you can see here, this is an example of a rectifier diode. If you open it, this part here, the black part, the one with no strip, the silver strip, these are composed of, uh, this, this is composed of p-type materials. And with this side, where there is a strip, these are n-type materials. No? Uh, the p-type, the whole are the majority carriers. And for the n-type, the electron are the majority carriers. So as you can see in a microscopic level, super microscopic level, this is their setup. This is the P region for the, which means P region, P type material, N region, N type material. And the junction they created is called PN junction. No? So as you can see, hole here, positive, they are the majority carriers, or most of the particles here are holes. No? No? And for the and for this you know, uh, N type, most particles here or most components here. Are, ele are electron. That's why it's an, a ne and it, this is a negative charge. Sometimes this pin junction is called the depletion region. Okay, so what I'm presenting here, 
to you all is uh, the most common example of semiconductor of a semiconductor where doping has been done. Okay, so this is a product of doping. So let's proceed. Let's proceed to the basic theories in electronics. Okay, so we will be having here some concepts that we need to understand again. So we have common variables to deal with in, uh, in, in understanding better electronics engineering. We need to acquaint ourselves with the concept about voltage, resistance, inductance, charge, capacitance, and current. Okay, so proceeding. Uh, we need to remember also no, Alessandro Volta, an Italian physicist, uh, because of his study about batteries, about creating prototype of batteries, the unit for voltage is volt in honor of Alessandro Volta. Volt, Volta. How about current? Uh, Andre Marie Ampere also uh, is a French physicist. Uh, he solely devoted his life most about studying what is current, about theories about current. Now, in honor for him, the unit for current is Ampere. Okay, now his, his family name, Ampere. Andre Marie Ampere, and Ampere is the unit for current. Unit for voltage is volt, from Alessandro Volta, and the unit for current is Ampere because of Andre Marie Ampere. Again, uh, it is being given an honor to these people because these people have studied intensively their, almost their whole life, uh, um, trying to uncover the theories and explanations about phenomenon, about voltage phenomenon, about um, current. Okay, so that's Alessandro Volta and Andre Marie Ampere. Now next, we have here a German physicist, George Simon Ohm. Okay, George Simon Ohm. Uh, also studying about the concept of resistance. So in honor of his name, the unit for resistance is Ohm because of George Simon Ohm. And we also have here Charles Agustin de Coulomb, a French physicist, also, study, also studying about what's, what's a charge, how does a charge move, what are its characteristics. That's why in honor also of Charles Agustin de Coulomb, the unit for charge is Coulomb. Okay. Now, we have here Michael Faraday, an English scientist. Now, uh, studying about the prototype and the concept about capacitance. So, in honor of Michael Faraday, an English scientist, the unit for capacitance is Farad. Okay, Farad, Faraday, Farad. Okay, so remember. And also, we have this inductance. Now, the concept about inductance, the coils, mutual inductance, um, Auto, auto inductance like that. So the unit for inductance or in honor to the person who devoted mostly his life studying about the concept of inductance is Joseph Henry. So the unit for inductance is Henry and the unit for capacitance is Farad. Okay, no? So as you can see here, a pattern, it is usually they are, adap they are adapting the, um, they are adapting the uh, family name of those famous scientists or uh, or people persons uh, studying some phenomenon. So maybe you, uh, maybe you, uh, you are if you are listening to this presentation, if you may be doing something, studying uh, a unique phenomenon, and uh, uh, trying to unlock some theories about it, then maybe um, after you die, uh, uh, some people will appreciate all your works and will use your family name or your surname in order for you to be recognized as one great person studying that phenomenon during your lifetime. Okay, so who knows? You will be the next person to be uh, re recognized in the field of engineering and science and technology. Okay, so, okay, okay. So this is just, uh, just for fun. Huh? Hello, aspiring engineers. Let's play a game, play or pass. So you want to play or you want to pass? <laughs> so, okay, let's play. So I will be presenting here some, some questions to you and maybe you can answer it accordingly based on your own knowledge. No? So let's go. So what? So we are talking here about opposite characteristics and concepts. So with this question, what is the opposite of resistance? Okay, so what is the opposite of resistance? The opposite of resistance is conductance. Okay, moving on. 
What is the opposite of inductance? The opposite of inductance is reluctance. Okay. So I'm presenting here some trivia, no? Like you may be encountering some terms, and maybe that you need to know their differences, their opposite com concepts, in order for you to uh, better understand if ever you will encounter them. At least you will not be having misunderstanding. At least you will know that the opposite of one term is this, and the opposite of another term is this. So if it's, if it's opposite, therefore, they have opposing um, characteristics and almost like um, reverse definitions, more like that. Okay? So the next is, what is the opposite of capacitance? The opposite of capacitance? It's elastance. Okay? So maybe if you will take a... An engineering exam, uh, uh, electronics engineering board exam, usually these terminologies came, might came, might came out. So better prepare to uh, be familiar about these terminologies and these opposite characteristics and concepts. Now, the next is, what is the opposite of reactance? The answer, what is the opposite of reactance? The answer is susceptance. Okay, so uh, again, the goal here is I'm going to pre uh, I'm presenting to you some terminologies that in order for you to be familiarized with, because if you will read uh, deeper definitions about theories, about concepts, you, if you research other books, other journals, you might encounter this term. And I'm presenting it here to you so that you will have a grasp or idea like what pairs or what are the opposite of such terms, okay? Good, okay, so let's move on. Again, this is the next question. What is the opposite of impedance? The opposite of impedance is admittance, okay? The opposite of impedance is admittance. Then, what is the difference between permittivity and permeability? Can we interchange such, ter such terminologies? Okay, can we interchange? So the answer is permittivity is a term used on capacitance, while permeability is a term used on magnetism theories. No, so when you hear permittivity, we're talking capacitor here. When you hear permeability, we're talking about magnets here. And about the question that can we interchange such terminologies? The answer is no because uh, you cannot swap this term because they are being applied differently to specific theories. Permittivity for capacitance theories and permeability for magnetism theories, okay? So I hope you learned something. And congratulations, you just gained additional trivia about electronics engineering. So extra points, extra points, extra points. So again, the significance here is try to familiarize yourself with different terminologies in electronics engineering because uh, you might be encountering them anytime. And the best way to avoid misunderstanding is that you are familiar with their definitions and their concepts. Now, moving on. We were, this is the, these are the two directions of electricity flow. Like, uh, we have the electron flow from negative to positive. It's if, if the flow is from negative to positive, it's called electron flow. Then we also have the conventional flow or the whole flow. The positive will go to the negative. The positive will go to the negative. And sometimes if you can, if you will try to open books, uh, open um, reference books about discussion about electrical engineering or electronics engineering, uh, the conventional flow is the usually being used than the electron flow. So let's also study, let's also try to uncover how come that we have two flows. Why not just select one flow? Okay, so we, again, we have the electron flow, negative, positive, and the positive to negative, which is called the conventional flow or the whole flow. Now, we have some, we have some, uh, um, some conversations here. No? Uh, one person is saying that 
Is it true that conventional flow is actually a wrong theory? Then why should I use the wrong idea? Maybe you've already heard about this thing. Like why use the conventional flow if it's a wrong idea? And then here's the monkey saying that it was Benjamin Franklin's fault <laughs> with, the, with the laughter. And then this blackbird will say, no, 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 it was actually not his fault. So we just switch, fact check, which is true. What do we need to know? So let's look at the story behind. Okay, so join me in looking at the story. So Benjamin Franklin did get it wrong. He had just developed a, remar a remarkable new theory of electricity in which positive and negative had specific and accurate meanings and he was unable to apply the two labels in the way he intended. No? So the labeling of one polarity of charge as positive and the other as negative is totally arbitrary. Okay, no? So it works both ways. It could be done either way and everything will still work out the same. Franklin did not choose wrong, he just chose. Okay, so um, if you if you have heard some theories about uh, like how electricity was discovered, automatically the name Benjamin Franklin will come into your mind, no? Oh, Benjamin Franklin, that famous story where it's like um, there's there's like an incoming storm, oh, and then and, and, it, and usually, usually if there's an incoming storm or an upcoming thunderstorm, usually lightning goes or goes with in that scenario. And then I think you remember that, that in the story, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, this famous scientist uh, uses a kite, he's a kite and then he let, the flight, uh, he let the kite fly towards the sky. And after which the, the kite uh, 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 um, gets close to some thunder clouds and then with the influence influence of some charge, the kite uh, collected some charge and threw the kite into its string, uh, a light bulb, light, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's a light bulb, but uh, charges were collected at that time. And at that time, Benjamin Franklin, based on books, based on, if you look in previous books about electricity, uh, the, the old ones, Benjamin Franklin is then recognized as like the one who discovered electricity no? uh, with the use of kite in that story about uh, some thunder clouds uh, and the kite collecting the, some charges from the thunder cloud. So that's typically electricity at that time. Now, at that time, it's a very good discovery by Benjamin Franklin. And then he noticed that uh, there is a flow with the nature, as, as, as you can see in the flow, uh, Benjamin knew that uh, there is uh, there is this there it has two components no like uh, and then he is looking forward or trying to analyze it that uh, it has charge like it has a positive charge and it has a negative charge but at that time there is no such thing as books about electricity because obviously electricity was not discovered yet there is no reference like which is which this this thing called electricity flow from positive to negative or it flow from negative to positive or positive to negative no one knows so at that time benjamin franklin discovered the phenomenon but arbitrarily he still he still not capable of knowing whether it's from positive to negative or negative to positive so he just needs to choose no so Franklin did not choose wrong, he just chose. No? The important thing is uh, electricity was discovered and about the concept of is it negative to positive or positive to negative, that was really arbitrary. Okay, so because in Franklin's time, electricity is not yet called electricity, it's called electric fluid at that time. No? It was thought to be composed of two fluids, the one is vitreous and the second is called resinous. That annihilated each other when they came into contact. So with this vitreous component and resinous component, uh, Franklin thought that one of these has a negative charge and one of these has a positive charge. So Franklin's clever idea was to realize that the two fluid theory was redundant and that a single fluid flowing through metals would suffice. This led him directly to an analogy with water pressure or air in which a single fluid flows from the end of a pipe that has a positive pressure 
and towards the end with a negative or vacuum-like pressure. That problem was that Franklin had no way. No, it's no way because uh, there's no such thing as high-tech devices at that time. So the problem was that Franklin had no way to separate the fluid from the metal to tell which way it was moving. It could make sparks, sure, but the fluid electricity moves so incredibly fast that nothing accurate could be discerned from watching them. So that's why uh, he just said that, okay, uh, I'm judging that this uh, electric fluid moves from positive to negative. And then books were created at that time. Only then, it was only like decades later with the invention of Crookes tube, no? It was only with the invention decades later of the Crookes tube that it became possible to tell the direction of flow of this mysterious electrical fluid, specifically by watching the shadows it cast on the inside of an empty tube. So decades later, so at that time, different books about electricity have already been published. No, so decades, uh, we know that as we know, one decade is composed of 10 years. No, so as you can see, with the invention of Crookes tube, like several decades, uh, with the published with the publication of the books of of about electricity, about the discoveries of um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, they realized that electricity really flow from negative to positive, and not the other, and not the conventional. Okay, so that's why they use the word conventional. Like it was the one being used ever since the beginning. So they use the word conventional, no, the positive to negative. Decades later before realizing that it's wrong. But how are you going to pacif pacify it? Like, are you going to, to get all those published books already and then you are going to look for the pages saying that electricity flow from positive to negative, you will simply change that to electricity really flow from negative to positive. So it, it would be a very big overhaul to do that. So that's why there are the two flows about electricity were then presented. The conventional flow, the one being assumed to be correct yet is the plus to minus or positive to negative. But in reality, electricity really flows from negative to positive. So that's why it depends now with your analysis. So the best thing here is, you know that the correct flow of electricity is from negative to positive. But also in honor also of the efforts of the previous scientists studying electricity, that's why you can also use the conventional current flow. But knowing that the real thing is, the real thing about electricity is that it really flows from negative to positive. So it works both ways. The important thing is that you know the concept. You know the reason like why it happened. You know it by context. Okay, so you need to consider the net flow of charge. So if you considered only the election flow as current, your calculations would be wrong. No? If this is a conventional current, the electron current is the opposite one. No? If this is a sheet of metal, the electron current is the actual flow of electricity. Okay? So now we have three important requirements of a basic electrical circuit. No? Uh, in order for us to create a complete or the most simple form of an electrical circuit, it should, has three, it, it should have three components. First is that it, there should be a source, there should be a complete path, and there should be a load. So this is an example. The battery is the source, the light bulb is the load, and the wires being used are the path. Okay, so this is the flow of electricity, no? From negative to positive. And with this movement of electricity, or electron flow, the light bulb lights up. So electron flow involving a source, conductors, and a load. Okay, so this is just an example about a complete circuit, a simple, complete electrical circuit. Now, this is the negative and this is the positive. So as you can just see here, these are flow of million or like billions of electrons moving in this, um, like in this conductor. Like for example, in this, it's a copper wire. So you can just see a copper wire here, but if you use a superior, electron microscope, you can see that the electrons are moving from one valence shell to another in a very fast fashion. And that's electricity for you, from negative to positive. So as long as there is an applied potential, electrons will continue to eject themselves 
from their atoms to create an electric current. No? So uh, an, an electron from this atom will jump to another to another up, atom and then jump again to another atom. So there is this process of um, conduct, uh, conduction and there's also this process of recombination. No? Conduction, recombination, conduction, recombination. It's a very, very fast process. We cannot see it with our naked eye. But that is the concept about electricity. Electricity is the flow of electrons, no? The flow of electrons, not the flow of protons or not the flow of neutrons. Again, so therefore, the particle that is the particles that are involved in an electron of an in of in an electricity are only the electrons. Okay, the neutron and the neutron and the proton just uh, stay in the in the nucleus of the atoms. Okay, so let's not. I mean, misunderstand that thought about understanding ele electrical flow. So we have different sources for electrical circuits. Uh, as you can see, we have a DC or direct current source, uh, usually uh, in this form. We have these uh, symbols for that. And we have an AC source. AC stands for alternating current. DC stands for direct current. So let's see about their examples. So these are types of AC waveforms, no? And uh, it has a component of amplitude, uh, the period, and it, we have the sine wave, the complex wave, the triangular wave, and the square wave. So there are different forms, no? different uh, examples of an alternating current waveforms. It depends on the application of the application of the electronic system. But usually, what we usually use for continuous applications, continuous array of data that needs to be processed. Usually, it's all about sine wave, this basic sine wave. And if it's a digital application, usually square waves are used. For differentiators and integrator application, it, it uses triangular wave. But to some um, special transmissions, it, it is in the form of complex wave. So again, it depends on the actual application or the nature of the source itself. Okay. So I'm presenting to you here types of AC waveforms. Now, the graphs of sources for electrical circuits, uh, so a direct current, if you graph it in an oscillator, it has a straight line only. So this is direct or this is DC. Then this green one, this is an alternating current. This is AC. It has a positive alteration, it has a negative alteration. Now, if you combine, okay guys, so if you combine an alternating current and a direct current, what is being created here is a pulsating DC or sometimes called DC with AC. Okay, so if you combine alternating and direct current, it returns to, it becomes a pulsating DC. Now, so that's why in order for you to really straighten this up, you need to use uh, filters, filtering circuits. And if you really want a pulsating DC to be pure DC, okay? And sometimes you also have some sources like complex, like kind of ambiguous source with many noise, including in it. Uh, you will have like an irregular pattern. It's more like a sine wave with sudden spikes and then unclear slope or direction. It's called a variable uh, signal, variable source. And since it has like the component of that related to AC, it is still under the category of AC. But by definition, it's a variable, it's a variable AC signal. Okay, so I'm presenting it, I'm presenting to you here some several forms of sources if you put them in an oscilloscope and visually look at their characteristics. Okay, so this is AC, DC, pulsating DC, and then a variable AC. Okay, so I'm not so now let, let us also review the parts of a sinusoidal signal. So uh, I think you you have encountered it in your um, in your subject in plane trigonometry or no uh, the, like the parts of a signal like this is the positive alteration, this is negative alteration, and one complete cycle. The time it takes to have one complete cycle it's called the period. No, from zero to uh, zero to this part. No. And the topmost part in the positive alteration is called crest or the positive maximum. And the topmost part in the negative alteration is called true, true or called negative maximum. And altogether, these maximums, these 
negative maximum and this positive maximum are called antinodes. No? They are the same. They are called antinodes, but the negative antinode is called throw and the positive antinode is called crest. No? That's it. And frequency, as you can see, the frequency is defined as the cycles per second and the unit for frequency is hertz. Like for example, in one second, um, the, the source has um, 60 repetitions. Therefore, your frequency is 60 hertz. Okay, and and the length of the the length of the signal or the magnitude from zero to that to the positive maximum it's called amplitude. No, and from zero to zero to negative maximum is also called amplitude. And if you will measure from peak to peak, it's called the peak to peak measurement of the signal. Okay, so. Uh, as you can see here, these are an example of an electrical circuit, electronic circuit. You have a capacitor here, this is store uh, voltage drop trying to be measured, this is a toggle switch. So as you can see here, this, this is an example of a DC source. No, It's a sample circuit having a DC source. So this is a DC source. You can, you can see the plus and minus sign. No? How about this one? This is also a sample circuit having an AC source. So this is a symbol for an AC source, more like an AC signal inside the circle and then usually it has the component of how many what is its frequency like for example 30 hertz and this, this zero degrees and this 25 degrees are the phase angle so that's the characteristic now of an AC source so the more you study electronics or electrical circuits you will encounter most of these circuits like for example this is a capacitor we had a 330 microfarad uh, resist a bogus resistor with one pico ohm uh, this is an inductor with 150 uh, millihenry, uh, 450 millihenry. So, and then the connections. So, this, this is the world of electronics and of electrical circuits. Okay. So, proceeding. This is Ohm's law. We're now going to discuss what is Ohm's law. Ohm's law is current I is directly proportional to the voltage and is inversely proportional to the resistance. Okay. I equals V over R. This is Ohm's law. This is the most common um, law used in calculating electronic circuits and electrical circuits. So you need to be familiar about this, okay? So this, this is just an example like how an Ohm's law behaves. So going back to this formula, we're talking about current here, no? So Ohm's law is talking about current. It doesn't talk about voltage. It doesn't talk about resistance. It talks about current. And then the only way to get current is you have the value of V over R. So it's all talks about current. So if this is the current, we know, as we know, the unit for current is amperes. Uh, it is being, since it is um, it, it is uh, directly proportional to volt, then the picture here is the volt is, as, as long as the voltage increases, the current also increases. But as you can see here, since the current is inversely proportional to the resistance, the resistance is like the antagonist for the current flow. So the the more resistance the material has, the harder for the current to flow. Okay, so it's, it's more like an amine, but it's an analogy of what is Ohm's law. Voltage, resistance, and current. Okay, so now let's proceed with series and parallel circuits. This is a series circuit, and this is a parallel circuit. No? This is the source, and the loads are connected in series. And this is the current flow. As you can see, positive to negative. So positive to negative, this is conventional current flow. But the actual flow is from negative to positive. Now, with this, the parallel circuit is the source, and the loads are connected parallel to each other. So again, from positive to negative, what the, this picture is using conventional current flow. But as we know, the real current flow is from negative to positive. Okay, so that's... That's uh, our knowledge about series circuit and parallel circuit. So in parallel circuit, the total current is equal to the current in load one and current in load two. So if you have like five milliampere of current in load two, no, the five milliampere current in load two. So the total current in parallel is that you add the currents. You add you can you add the current of load one and you add the current of load two. So load one current plus load two current equals the total current of the whole circuit. But since they are parallel, the voltage level at load two 
is equal to the voltage level of load one. Okay, so that's the setup here. Now, looking at the series circuit, the series circuit is opposite, quite the opposite. And for the series circuit, the voltage drop of load one plus the voltage drop of load two is the overall total voltage of the circuit. However, their current, the current flowing in load one is equal to the current flowing in load two. Okay? So again, let's review uh, in parallel. The equal thing in parallel circuits are voltage. Voltages are equal, but the current is summation. Again, for parallel circuits, the voltages are equal, but the currents are summation. For series circuits, the voltage are summation and the current is equal. The currents are equal, the voltages are summation. Those that is the characteristic for series circuit. So again, you need to know between parallel and series circuit what are summation and what are equal. Again, for parallel, summation is current, voltage equal. For series, voltage, summation, current equal. Okay? So let's familiarize ourselves with that thing. Now, this is a sample circuit having series and parallel loads, no? So it doesn't mean that if you construct a circuit, if you design it to be parallel, automatically all connections are parallel. So you can also mix it, no? You can just mix it. Like for example, if you have this switch, you have this battery. So bulb, these two bulbs are in series with each other, and these two motors are parallel with each other. Okay, so you can actually use your creativity depending on the application you're trying to uh create like is this, is this circuit used for um uh for um triggering an alarm is it circuit is this circuit used for um operating a generator or is this circuit used for detecting if uh if the circuit is uh is hazardous or not or or by inspection or troubleshooting it depends on the application there are a wide array of um, application as long as you just need to be aware what are the characteristics of a series circuit and a parallel circuit. You can always join them together in terms of circuit design and concept explanation. Okay, so let's proceed. So now we now proceed with KVL and KCL. No? KVL and KCL. So what are these acronyms stand for? So KVL stands for Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now, by definition or by theoretical definition, it, say, it, it says that the algebraic sum of all voltages in a loop is equal to zero. That means, like for example, you have this voltage, you have this resistor one, resistor two, and resistor three. So what do you mean by that? So if this voltage, this voltage source is being distributed, its voltage value, is distributed is distributed along this loop so this is one loop no this one loop is more like a one complete path from the source going back to the source this is called a loop so the algeb algebraic sum of all voltages in a loop is equal to zero that means if you want to know the overall voltage source value you need to add the voltage drop of resistor one the voltage drop of resistor two and the voltage drop of resistor 3. No? So VR1 plus VR2 plus VR3 equals to V. Simple as that. So that is Kirchhoff's voltage law. So I'm presenting this to you because sooner or later, if you study more about circuits, you need to calculate some missing values. Like for example, um, you have the value of VR3, and then you have the value of V, then you have the value of VR2. Now, how are you going to solve for the value of VR1? So using this Kirchhoff's voltage law, you can solve the voltage drops of components in a circuit within a, a loop. Okay, so that's how you use Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now proceeding, KCL. KCL stands for Kirchhoff's current law. What does it mean? This dot here is called a node. No? And by theoretical definition, Kirchhoff's current law states that the sum of all currents entering a given node is equal to the sum of all currents leaving that node. So, as you can see in this picture, 
this is the node. So the currents entering, the currents now in the form of arrows entering this node, visually we can see the currents entering or the arrows, the, the arrowheads towards the node is I2 and I1. And the currents leaving the node are their arrowheads against or not looking directly to the node are I3 and I4. So obviously we can see that I1 and I2 are entering the node and I3 and I4 are leaving the node. That means the sum of all currents entering a given node, I2, I1, so I1 plus I2 is equal to the equal sign to the sum of all currents leaving that node. The I3 and I4 are leaving the node, so I3 plus I4. Okay, that's Kirchhoff's current law. So this is also used in calculating the values of currents entering or leaving the node. So going back, if Kirchhoff's voltage law usually is being used in calculating several voltage drops or the overall value of the voltage source, it all talks about voltage. Kirchhoff's current law is used also in calculating currents entering, currents leaving in a given node. So if you are going to use KVL or KCL, it depends on the problem. If you're looking about the values of the voltages, use KVL. If you look, if you're looking for the values of the currents, use KCL. Okay. Now, uh, when we when you deal with calculations about uh, turning turning a uh, turning a triangle into Y or turning a Y into triangle, we have these um, conversions no, in resistor calculations. Is this is Y to delta conversion, and the next part is um, delta to Y conversion. Now, for example, if you're going to solve for this, like for example, you have this um, delta. Delta is a triangle, no? delta, and you want to convert this triangle into letter Y. That means in order to solve for the value of C, the value of C is AB over A plus B plus C. And for the value of small letter A, that means B times C over A plus B plus C. And for the value of B, that's A times C over A plus B. So the keyword here is neighbors over total. No, as you can see, the, their formulas of A, B, and C they have they have the, they have the similar uh, denominator, but they differentiate in their numerator, numerator formula. For A is neighbors over total. No, for B neighbors over total, and for C is neighbors over total. For A, what are the neighbors of A? The neighbors of A, as visually we can see, it's B times C. So B times C, that's the neighbor. Okay, so it's neighbor over total. So for letter B, what are your neighbor? It's A and C. That's why AC here. And for letter C, the neighbors are A and B. So simple as that. So this is just a simple substitution. No? If, you, if you try to analyze circuits and you might convert it from delta to Y or Y to delta. Now, for the next, like for example, if you have this letter Y, if you have this letter Y, and then you want to convert it into triangle or delta, how are you going to get the capital letter A resistor, the capital letter B resistor, and the capital letter C resistor? So how to do that? It's all about combinations over opposite. So they have similar numerators, but different denominators. Opposite to this one, no? They have similar denominators, but uh, varying numerators they have similar denominator but their numerators are different opposite to this one they have similar numerator but different denominators so in order to solve for a combinations over opposite so what's the opposite resistor for a this one see this is the opposite one that's why we put a here for b what's the opposite resistor for b this one so that's why you put B here. And what's the opposite resistor for C? This one. So that's why you put C here. So you, you usually use these conversions if you are trying to analyze a complex circuit and maybe converting the three into a Y or Y into delta. Okay, so this you're simply going to use a simple substitution. 
what I'm presenting here is just just be aware about the concept of their one about their conversion. It can be neighbors over total or combinations over opposite. Okay. So now proceeding, we are now discuss about battery. Battery. What's a battery? Battery here is a battery is a combination or collection of similar cells. A cell is the fundamental source of electrical energy developed through the conversion of chemical energy or solar energy. So as you can see here, these are examples of battery. No? So uh, in, in terms of schematic symbol, this is the schematic symbol of a battery. No? So uh, I think you, these are some famous brands no? about battery. But by definition, a battery is a combination or collection of similar cells. Now, the symbol for a, for a cell is just one straight horizontal line and long and one small horizontal line or a short horizontal line. So if you connect several levels of cell, it's called a battery. No, so, so you can see that's why, as you can see here, based on a schematic symbol, a battery is like two cells connected. No? And a cell is the fundamental source of electrical energy developed through the conversion of chemical or solar energy. So a battery is a transducer. No? A battery is a transducer. What is the definition of transducer? A transducer is, is any device capable of converting one form of energy into another. So a battery is a transducer that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. Chemical energy into electrical energy. That's a battery. What are other forms of transducer? Like for example, we have here a generator. No? A generator converts um, mechanical energy into electrical energy. How about a motor? A motor converts electrical energy to mechanical energy. No? How about um, a solar panel? No? A solar panel. A solar panel converts solar energy into electrical energy. How about a flashlight? A flashlight converts, or a flashlight or a fluorescent lamp. It's a transducer that converts electrical energy into light energy. So that those are, we have different forms of transducer, no? So we need to be aware also of the word transducer. And a battery is just an example of a transducer. Okay, so the more you also study about electronics and electrical engineering concepts, you will be encountering several uh, forms or examples of transducer. No, like for example, windmill. Windmill, no? Windmill is it converts wind energy into electrical energy. See? So it's it's it. Th those are several um several uh, examples of a transducer. So at least now I hope you are now aware about the term transducer because you appreciate better its concept if you study its several examples because it, there, there is a wide array of transducers in the world of engineering, technology, and science. Okay, so just research, just study uh, more theories, just study, just open more books or read some journals about it. Okay, so uh, there are two types of cells. We have the primary cells and the secondary cells. Now, which is which? So the secondary is rechargeable while the primary is not. That's the chemical reaction that the secondary cell can be reversed to restore its capacity. Okay, so the advantage of using a secondary cell is that it can reduce the cost associated with not having to continually replace discharged primary cells. So the most commonly used rechargeable batteries are lead acid. Lead acid batteries, no? If you have some cars, usually the cars are utilizing lead acid batteries, no? Uh, that's why uh, like, like every year or every one and a half year, uh, you have to recharge these batteries. So those batteries in the cars in most automobiles are lead acid batteries. Now, like also with, uh, uh, with cell phones today, uh, we have the nickel cadmium, the nickel cadmium. Uh, they, are, they, they are also um, rechargeable batteries. They are usually used in calculators, the tools, like, like if you open your calculator, the, the one you see that, that, that circle, it's a nickel cadmium, no? uh, it's a battery using calculators, tools, photo flash units, cell phones. But I think now uh, it's no longer nickel cadmium in cell phones. It's lithium ion, you know, lithium ion batteries. No? That's why you can also, uh, it's, an, it's a better version of rechargeable batteries than nickel cadmium. So 
as we know technology always improves itself along over over time so expect that there will be more better forms of batteries in the near future no? so let let technology complete its course and flow freely now to solve for the battery life we use the following formula no because battery life is in the form of the unit for battery life is ampere hours no? or milliampere hours so the formula for that is battery life is ampere if you you have to calculate the working current then the hour rating as you can see in the battery and then the amperes grow the dampers uh, utilized during the use of the device so ampere times hour rating over amperes that's the formula for battery life okay so uh, i'm presenting to you here some types of uh, batteries with their uh, some examples of batteries with their corresponding types whether it's whether they are primary or secondary and their nominal open circuit voltage now at first maybe you can see to it that uh am i really going to memorize this or uh, what's the importance of familiarizing myself with these concepts now as for me uh, just uh um just an advice usually uh the one that uh learns more has the advantage no and sometimes when you take the electronics engineering board exam uh, you have these questions like you will be asked what is the nominal open circuit voltage of a lead acid battery and sometimes that spells the difference between top notchers and ordinary board passing ordinary board exam passers now, so i think it's more of trivia and also specific applications so we have here now the carbon zinc zinc chloride manganese dioxide or the alkaline batteries the mercuric oxide silver oxide lead acid nickel cadmium nickel iron or the edison cell sometimes called the silver zinc silver cadmium nickel metal hydrate so you can see here whether they are primary primary secondary no again prime the, the advantage about secondary types is that these type of batteries are rechargeable the primary batteries is not capable of being recharged again so that's why after utilizing all their stored voltages then we simply have to throw them Okay, of course, in a safe way, no, don't just throw battery outside the road. You have to really bury it deep uh, in the soil so that uh, it cannot be toxic and harmful to to uh, to the surrounding. Okay, so these are these are their nominal open circuit voltages. Okay, so we also have sizes for popular types of dry cells or batteries. No, we have this. That's why, as you can see there, in your remote control in your TV, the toy of your favorite cousin of your uh of your brother sisters so, you know so we have this uh triple a double a c and b so these are their specific height in terms of inches and their specific diameter in terms of inches okay so i'm just again presenting it to you here so that you will have uh knowledge now oh, okay so batteries really have uh that's why i am i'll buy a triple a or i'll buy a double a or a c or a d and these are their they have different applications different um, um voltage ratings and different um diameters and height okay so i'm presenting it to you here and maybe you can you can use this sooner in your design projects and applications okay so three about batteries now as you can see the carbon zinc dry cell is the most common type of dry cell it is also called the clutch cell Zinc chloride cells are often referred to as the heavy duty type. Voltaic cell is also called as galvanic cell, named after Luigi Galvani. Alkaline cell is better for heavy duty use than the zinc chloride cell. Dry cell, okay, no? take, take note. Dry cell loses its ability to produce output voltage when it, when it is not being used. So as my advice, if you buy battery, don't try to overstore batteries because um, even if you're not using them, time will come that they will lose their voltage stored into them and this is scientifically proven huh? okay so it's better to use battery and just uh, store just uh, just a little not too much because you don't know when will be the next time you're going to use the battery okay so don't don't uh, because dry cell really loses its ability to produce output voltage when it is not being used no? so if you have battery use it is it okay so the shelf life of alkaline types is only about two years carbon zinc has lesser shelf life no the zinc chloride and sodium sulfur cells are under development 
for use in electric vehicles. No? I think uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles are 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 the new are the new uh, the new frontier now in designing vehicles. No, so batteries play a major role in designing those type of vehicles. No, but here's our, here are some latest developments. No, plastic cells are a recent development made from a conductive polymer. This cell could have 10 times the power of the lead type acid type with one tenth the weight and one third of the volume. So smaller, but more powerful. So that's how technology uh, is fast um, improving with its examples, with its uh, applications. Like sometimes we can say that sky's the limit, no? So this is these are just some previous about batteries, no? Like maybe maybe you will have a report about batteries or a further study about batteries. So what I'm presenting here to you is that maybe you can use some of some of these um, facts and develop insights about them in order to uh, pursue uh, an innovative design involving batteries. Okay, who knows? Your your design will be the next one that will spell um, new disruption in the world of technology specifically in the world of electronics engineering, okay? So, uh, in solving and analyzing electronic circuits, you have three primary weapons, no? So again, as long as you know the concept about Ohm's law, KVL and KCL, uh, as you know, Ohm's law is, is the current, I equals V over R, voltage over resistance. KVL stands for uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Uh, it's, it means that the algebraic sum of all voltages in a loop is equal to zero. And for KCL, Kirchhoff's current law is that um, the sum of all the currents entering the node is equal to the sum of the currents leaving the node. So this actually, when analyzing electronic circuits or electrical circuits, as long as you have a strong foundation about Ohm's law, KVL and KCL, then you will not have difficulty in analyzing electronic circuits, especially, especially with the mathematical calculation, determining the the voltage proper, the voltage drops, the overall current, and, and then you encounter parallel circuits and series circuits, then as long as you remember the concept of Ohm's law, KVL and KCL, then all would be very easy, as long as you have a strong foundation about them. Okay? So I, I, I am encouraging you to study further about these three things in order for you to be always ready when analyzing electronic or electrical circuits, okay? So I hope you put that as a promise in your minds. Now, so challenge yourself to master electronics, no? We need to challenge ourselves to master electronics, no? Or be like the student and fail. Okay, so sometimes, uh, this is just a meme, okay? Meme, like, I'm looking forward that if you study electrical or electronics circuits, try to really put time in studying. I'm not saying that game time is, uh, is a bad thing because, uh, Playing games is also part of um, debriefing ourselves from stress or if we might misunderstand something, we need to move away temporarily from reality and try to refresh our minds, but we just read what we get in life. No? So what I'm trying to present here is um, try to study and try also to play games, but not too much games because uh, if, you, if, the, if you are very enthusiastic about games and not that enthusiastic in studying, then it would defeat the purpose of you being uh, an enthusiast or a student about electronics engineering or electrical engineering. No? So it's more of check and balance no? about, about our uh, lifestyle. So of course, um, all talks and no play, I all study and no play makes, makes Jack a damn boy. So it's just balance. No? So, Looking forward for you to um, embrace the world of electronics engineering and be the next innovative designer in the near future. Again, it's all about balance. It's all about mastery. It's all about enthusiasm. Okay, so uh, that would be my presentation about the introduction to some contest concepts about electronics engineering. And I hope you uh, you learn some few interesting stuff. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you and God bless.